This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Aeneid of Virgil, translated by John Dryden. Book 10. The gates of heaven unfold. Jove summons all the gods to counsel in the common hall. Sublimely seated, he surveys from far the fields, the camp, the fortune of the war, and all the inferior world. From first to last, the sovereign senate in degrees are placed. Then thus the almighty sire began, Ye gods, natives, or denizens of blessed abodes, from whence these murmurs and this change of mind, this backward fate from what was first designed? Why this protracted war, when my commands pronounced a peace, and gave the Latian lands? What fear or hope on either part divides our heavens, and arms our powers on different sides? A lawful time of war at length will come, nor need your haste anticipate the doom, when Carthage shall contend the world with Rome, shall force the rigid rocks and alpine chains, and like a flood come pouring on the plains. Then is your time for faction and debate, for partial favor and permitted hate. Let now your immature dissension cease. Sit quiet, and compose your souls to peace. Thus Jupiter, in few, unfolds the charge. But lovely Venus thus replies at large, O power immense, eternal energy, for to what else protection can we fly? Seest thou the proud Rutulians, how they dare in fields unpunished and insult my care? How lofty Turnus vaunts amidst his train, in shining arms triumphant on the plain? Even in their lines and trenches they contend, and scarce their walls the Trojan troops defend. The town is filled with slaughter, and o'erfloats with a red deluge their increasing moats, Aeneas, ignorant and far from thence, has left a camp exposed without defence. This endless outrage shall they still sustain? Shall Troy renewed be forced and fired again? A second siege my banished issue fears, and a new Diomede in arms appears. One more audacious mortal will be found, and I, thy daughter, wait another wound. Yet if with fates averse without thy leave the Latian lands my progeny receive, bear they the pains of violated law, and thy protection from their aid withdraw. But if the gods their sure success foretell, if those of heaven consent with those of hell to promise Italy, who dare debate the power of Jove or fix another fate? What should I tell of tempests on the main, of Aeolus usurping Neptune's reign, of Iris sent with Bacchanalian heat to inspire the matrons and destroy the fleet. Now Juno to the Stygian sky descends, solicits hell for aid, and arms the fiends. That new example wanted yet above, an act that well became the wife of Jove. Electo, raised by her, with rage inflames the peaceful bosoms of the Latian dames, Imperial sway no more exalts my mind. Such hopes I had indeed while heaven was kind. Now let my happier foes possess my place, whom Jove prefers before the Trojan race, and conquer they whom you with conquest grace. Since you can spare from all your wide command no spot of earth, no hospitable land, which may my wandering fugitives receive, since haughty Juno will not give you leave, then, father, if I still may use that name, by ruined Troy yet smoking from the flame, I beg you, let Ascanius by my care be freed from danger and dismissed the war. Inglorious let him live, without a crown, the father may be cast on coasts unknown, struggling with fate, but let me save the son. Mine is Kithera. Mine the Cyprian towers, in those recesses and those sacred bowers, obscurely let him rest, his right resign to promised empire and his Julian line. 
Then Carthage may the Alsonian towns destroy, nor fear the race of a rejected boy. What profits it, my son, to scape the fire, armed with his gods and loaded with his sire, to pass the perils of the seas and wind, evade the Greeks and leave the war behind, to reach the Italian shores, if, after all, our second Pergamus is doomed to fall? Much better had he curbed his high desires, and hovered o'er his ill-extinguished fires, to Simois's banks the fugitives restore, and give them back to war, and all the woes before. Deep indignation swelled Saturnia's heart, and must I own, she said, my secret smart, what with more decence were in silence kept, and but for this unjust reproach had slept? Did God or man your favorite son advise, with war unhoped, the Latians to surprise? By fate you boast, and by the gods' decree he left his native land for Italy. Confess the truth. By mad Cassandra more than heaven inspired he sought a foreign shore. Did I persuade to trust his second Troy to the raw conduct of a beardless boy, with walls unfinished which himself forsakes, and through the waves a wandering voyage takes? When have I urged him meanly to demand the Tuscan aid and arm a quiet land? Did I or Iris give this mad advice, or made the fool himself the fatal choice? You think it hard the Latians should destroy with swords your Trojans and with fires your Troy. Hard and unjust indeed, for men to draw their native air, nor take a foreign law. That Turnus is permitted still to live to whom his birth a god and goddess give, but yet is just and lawful for your line to drive their fields and force with fraud to join. Realms not your own among your clans divide, and from the bridegroom tear the promised bride. Petition while you public arms prepare, pretend a peace and yet provoke a war. "'Twas given to you, your darling son, to shroud, "'to draw the dastard from the fighting crowd, "'and for a man obtend an empty cloud. "'From flaming fleets you turned the fire away, "'and changed the ships to daughters of the sea. "'But is my crime the queen of heaven offends "'if she presume to save her suffering friends? "'Your son, not knowing what his foes decree, you say is absent. Absent let him be. Yours is Cythera, yours the Cyprian towers, the soft recesses and the sacred bowers. Why do you then these needless arms prepare, and thus provoke a people prone to war? Did I with fire the Trojan town deface, or hinder from return your exiled race? Was I the cause of mischief, or the man whose lawless lust the fatal war began? Think on whose faith the adulterous youth relied. Who promised? Who procured the Spartan bride? When all the United States of Greece combined to purge the world of the perfidious kind, then was your time to fear the Trojan fate. Your quarrels and complaints are now too late. Thus Juno. Murmurs rise with mixed applause, just as they favor or dislike the cause. So winds, when yet unfledged in woods they lie, in whispers first their tender voices try, then issue on the main with bellowing rage, and storms to trembling mariners presage. Then thus to both replied the imperial god, who shakes heaven's axles with his awful nod. When he begins, the silent senate stand with reverence, listening to the dread command. The clouds dispel, the winds their breath restrain, and the hushed waves lie flatted on the main. Celestials, your attentive ears incline. Since, said the god, the Trojans must not join in wished alliance with the Latian line. Since endless jarrings and immortal hate tend but to discompose our happy state, the war henceforward be resigned to fate, each to his proper fortune stand or fall. Equal and unconcerned I look on all. Rutulians, Trojans are the same to me. 
and both shall draw the lots their fates decree. Let these assault, if fortune be their friend, and, if she favors those, let those defend. The fates will find their way. The thunderer said, and shook the sacred honors of his head, attesting Styx the inviolable flood, and the black regions of his brother God. Trembled the poles of heaven, and earth confessed the nod. This end the sessions had. The senate rise, and to his palace wait their sovereign through the skies. Meantime, intent upon their siege, the foes within their walls the Trojan host enclose. They wound, they kill, they watch at every gate, renew the fires, and urge their happy fate. The Aeneans wish in vain their wanted chief, hopeless of flight, more hopeless of relief. Thin on the towers they stand, and even those few a feeble, fainting, and dejected crew. Yet in the face of danger some there stood, the two bold brothers of Sarpedon's blood, Asius and Achmon, both the Asaraki, young Hymen, and though young, resolved to die. With these were Clarus and Thymetis joined, Tibris and Castor, both of Lycian kind. From Achmon's hands a rolling stone there came, so large it half deserved a mountain's name. Strong sinewed was the youth, and big of bone. His brother Menestheus could not more have done, or the great father of the intrepid son. Some firebrands throw, some flights of arrows send and some with darts, and some with stones defend. Amid the press appears the beauteous boy, the care of Venus and the hope of Troy. His lovely face unarmed, his head was bare, in ringlets o'er his shoulders hung his hair. His forehead circled with a diadem, distinguished from the crowd he shines a gem, enchased in gold or polished ivory set, amidst the meaner foil of sable jet. Nor Ismarus was wanting to the war, directing pointed arrows from afar, and death with poison armed, in Lydia born, where plenteous harvests the fat fields adorn, where proud Pactolus floats the fruitful lands, and leaves a rich manure of golden sands. There Capis, author of the Capuan name, and there was Menestheus too, increased in fame, since Turnus from the camp he cast with shame. Thus mortal war was waged on either side. Meantime the hero cuts the nightly tide. For, anxious, from Evander when he went, he sought the Tyrene camp and Tarchon's tent. Exposed the cause of coming to the chief, his name and country told, and asked relief. Proposed the terms, his own small strength declared, what vengeance proud Mazentius had prepared. What Turnus, bold and violent, designed, then showed the slippery state of humankind and a fickle fortune, warned him to beware, and to his wholesome counsel added prayer. Tarchon, without delay, the treaty signs, and to the Trojan troops the Tuscan joins. They soon set sail, nor now the fates withstand, their forces trusted with a foreign hand. Aeneas leads, Upon his stern appear two lions carved, which rising Ida bear, Ida to wandering Trojans ever dear. Under their grateful shade Aeneas sat, revolving war's events and various fate, his left young palace kept, fixed to his side, and oft of winds inquired and of the tide, oft of the stars and of their watery way, and what he suffered both by land and sea. Now, sacred sisters, open all your spring, the Tuscan leaders and their army sing, which followed great Aeneas to the war, their arms, their numbers, and their names declare. A thousand youths, brave Massacus, obey, born in the Tiger through the foaming sea, from Asium brought and Cosa by his care, for arms, light quivers, bows, and shafts they bear. Fierce Abbas next, his men bright armor wore, his stern Apollo's golden statue bore. Six hundred Populonia sent along, 
all skilled in martial exercise and strong. Three hundred more for battle Ilva joins, an isle renowned for steel and unexhausted mines. Asilus on his prow the third appears, who heaven interprets and the wandering stars. From offered entrails prodigies expounds, and peals of thunder with presaging sounds. A thousand spears in warlike order stand, sent by the Pisans under his command. Fair Ostor follows in the watery field, proud of his managed horse and painted shield. Graviska, noisome from the neighboring fen, and his own Kyra sent three hundred men, with those which Minio's fields and Pyrgi gave, all bred in arms unanimous and brave. Thou, muse, the name of Kineras renew, and brave Cupavo followed but by few, whose helm confessed the lineage of the man, and bore with wings displayed a silver swan. Love was the fault of his famed ancestry, whose forms and fortunes in his ensigns fly. For Cycnus loved unhappy Phaeton, and sung his loss in poplar groves alone beneath the sister shades to soothe his grief heaven heard his song and hastened his relief and changed to snowy plumes his hoary hair and winged his flight to chant aloft in air his son cupavo brushed the briny flood upon his stern a brawny centaur stood who heaved a rock and threatening still to throw with lifted hands alarmed the seas below they seemed to fear the formidable sight, and rolled their billows on to speed his flight. Orcnus was next, who led his native train of hardy warriors through the watery plain, the son of Manto by the Tuscan stream, from whence the Mantuan town derives the name. An ancient city, but of mixed descent, three several tribes compose the government. Four towns are under each, but all obey the Mantuan laws, and own the Tuscan sway. Hate to Mazentius armed five hundred more, whom Mincius from his sire Benacus bore. Mincius with wreaths of reeds his forehead covered o'er. These grave Auletes leads, a hundred sweep with stretching oars at once the glassy deep. Him and his martial train the triton bears. High on his poop the sea-green god appears. Frowning he seems his crooked shell to sound, And at the blast the billows dance around. A hairy man above the waist he shows, A porpoise tail beneath his belly grows, And ends a fish. His breast the waves divides, And froth and foam augment the murmuring tides. Full thirty ships transport the chosen train for Troy's relief and scour the briny main. Now was the world forsaken by the sun, and Phoebe half her nightly race had run. The careful chief, who never closed his eyes, himself the rudder holds, the sails supplies. A choir of Nereids meet him on the flood, once his own galleys hewn from Ida's wood. But now, as many nymphs, the sea they sweep, as rode before tall vessels on the deep. They know him from afar, and in a ring enclose the ship that bore the Trojan king. Kimodoke, whose voice excelled the rest, above the waves advanced her snowy breast. Her right hand stops the stern, her left divides the curling ocean and corrects the tides. She spoke for all the choir, and thus began, with pleasing words to warn the unknowing man. Sleeps our loved lord? O goddess born, awake! Spread every sail, pursue your watery track, and haste your course. Your navy once were we, from Ida's height descending to the sea. Till Turnus, as at anchor fixed we stood, presumed to violate our holy wood. Then, loosed from shore, we fled his fires profane. Unwillingly we broke our master's chain. And since have sought you through the Tuscan main, the mighty mother changed our forms to these, and gave us life immortal in the seas. But young Ascanius, in his camp distressed, by your insulting foes is hardly pressed, 
the Arcadian horsemen and Etrurian host, advance in order on the Latian coast, to cut their way the Daunian chief designs, before their troops can reach the Trojan lines. Thou, when the rosy morn restores the light, first arm thy soldiers for the ensuing fight. Thyself the fated sword of Vulcan wield, and bear aloft the impenetrable shield. Tomorrow's sun, unless my skill be vain, shall see huge heaps of foes in battle slain. Parting, she spoke, and with immortal force pushed on the vessel in her watery course, for well she knew the way. Impelled behind, the ship flew forward and outstripped the wind. The rest make up. Unknowing of the cause, the chief admires their speed, and happy omens draws. Then thus he prayed, and fixed on heaven his eyes. Hear thou, great mother of the deities, with turrets crowned, on Ida's holy hill fierce tigers, reined and curbed, obey thy will. Firm thy own omens, lead us on to fight, and let thy Phrygians conquer in thy right. He said no more. And now renewing day had chased the shadows of the night away. He charged the soldiers with preventing care, their flags to follow, and their arms prepare. Warned of the ensuing fight, and bade him hope the war. Now his lofty poop he viewed below, his camp encompassed, and the enclosing foe. His blazing shield embraced he held on high. The camp received the sign, and with loud shouts reply. Hope arms their courage. From their towers they throw their darts with double force and drive the foe. Thus, at the signal given, the cranes arise before the stormy south and blacken all the skies. King Turnus wondered at the fight renewed, till, looking back, the Trojan fleet he viewed, the seas with swelling canvas covered o'er and the swift ships descending on the shore. The Latians saw from far with dazzled eyes the radiant crest that seemed in flames to rise, and to dart diffusive fires around the field, and the keen glittering of the golden shield. Thus threatening comets, when by night they rise, shoot sanguine streams and sadden all the skies. So Sirius, flashing forth sinister lights, pale humankind with plagues and with dry famine fright. Yet Turnus with undaunted mind is bent to man the shores and hinder their descent, and thus awakes the courage of his friends. What you so long have wished kind fortune sends, in ardent arms to meet the invading foe, you find and find him at advantage now. Yours is the day, you need but only dare. Your swords will make you masters of the war. Your sires, your sons, your houses, and your lands, and dearest wives are all within your hands. Be mindful of the race from whence you came, and emulate in arms your father's fame. Now take the time, while staggering yet they stand with feet unfirm, and prepossess the strand. Fortune befriends the bold. Nor more, he said, but balanced whom to leave and whom to lead. Then these elects the landing to prevent, and those he leaves to keep the city pent. Meantime the Trojan sends his troops ashore. Some are by boats exposed, by bridges more. With laboring oars they bear along the strand, where the tide languishes and leap a land. Tarkon observes the coast with careful eyes, and where no ford he finds, no water fries nor billows with unequal murmurs roar, but smoothly slide along and swell the shore. That course he steered, and thus he gave command. Here ply your oars, and at all hazard land. Force on the vessel, that her keel may wound this hated soil and furrow hostile ground. Let me securely land, I ask no more, then sink my ships, or shatter on the shore. This fiery speech inflames his fearful friends. They tug at every oar, and every stretcher bends. They run their ships aground, the vessels knock, thus forced ashore, and tremble with the shock. 
Tarkon's alone was lost, that stranded stood, stuck on a bank and beaten by the flood. She breaks her back, the loosened sides give way, and plunge the Tuscan soldiers in the sea. Their broken oars and floating planks withstand their passage while they labor to the land, and ebbing tides bear back upon the uncertain sand. Now Turnus leads his troops without delay, advancing to the margin of the sea. The trumpets sound, Aeneas first assailed, the clowns new raised and raw, and soon prevailed. Great Theron fell, an omen of the fight. Great Theron, large of limbs, of giant height, he first in open field defied the prince. But armor scaled with gold was no defense against the fated sword which opened wide his plated shield and pierced his naked side next lycus fell who not like others born was from his wretched mother ripped and torn sacred o phoebus from his birth to thee for his beginning life from biting steel was free not far from him was gaius laid along of monstrous bulk with cisseus fierce and strong vain bulk and strength for when the chief assailed, nor valor nor Herculean arms availed, nor their famed father wont in war to go with great Alcides while he toiled below, the noisy Pharos next received his death. Aeneas writhed his dart and stopped his bawling breath. Then wretched Chidon had received his doom, who courted Clytius in his beardless bloom, and sought with lust obscene polluted joys, the Trojan sword had cured his love of boys, had not his seven bold brethren stopped the course of the fierce champions with united force. Seven darts were thrown at once, and some rebound from his bright shield, some on his helmet sound. The rest had reached him, but his mother's care prevented those, and turned aside in air. The prince then called Achates to supply the spears that knew the way to victory. Those fatal weapons which inured to blood in Grecian bodies under Ilium stood, not one of those my hand shall toss in vain against our foes on this contended plain. He said, then seized a mighty spear and threw, which winged with fate through Maon's buckler flew, pierced all the brazen plates and reached his heart. He staggered with intolerable smart. Alcanor saw, and reached, but reached in vain, his helping hand, his brother to sustain. A second spear, which kept the former course, from the same hand, and sent with equal force, his right arm pierced, and, holding on, bereft his use of both, and pinioned down his left. The Numitor from his dead brother drew the illumined spear, and at the Trojan threw. Preventing fate directs the lance awry, which, glancing, only marked Akate's thigh. In pride of youth the Sabine Clausus came, and from afar at Dryops took his aim. The spear flew hissing through the middle space, and pierced his throat directed at his face. It stopped at once the passage of his wind, and the free soul to flitting air resigned. His forehead was the first that struck the ground. Life-blood and life rushed mingled through the wound. He slew three brothers of the Borean race, and three whom Ismaras, their native place, had sent to war, but all the sons of Thrace. Halesus next the bold Arunki leads, the son of Neptune to his aid succeeds, conspicuous on his horse. On either hand these fight to keep, and those to win the land. With mutual blood the Ausonian soil is dyed, while on its borders each their claim decide. As wintry winds contending in the sky with equal force of lungs their titles try, they rage, they roar, the doubtful rack of heaven stands without motion and the tide undriven. Each bent to conquer, neither side to yield, they long suspend the fortune of the field. Both armies thus perform what courage can, foot set to foot and mingled man to man. But in another part the Arcadian horse with ill success engaged the Latin force. For where the impetuous torrent rushing down huge craggy stones and rooted trees had thrown, they left their coursers, and unused to fight on foot, were scattered in a shameful flight. Pallas, who with disdain and grief had viewed his foes pursuing and his friends pursued, used threatenings mixed with prayers, his last resource, with these to move their minds, 
with those to fire their force. Which way, companions, whether would you run, by you yourselves and mighty battles won, by my great sire, by his established name, and early promise of my future fame, by my youth emulous of equal right, to share his honours, shun ignoble flight. Trust not your feet, your hands must hew way through yon black body and that thick array. Tis through that forward path that we must come. There lies our way, and that our passage home. Nor powers above, nor destinies below, oppress our arms. With equal strength we go, with mortal hands to meet a mortal foe. See on what foot we stand, a scanty shore, the sea behind our enemies before. No passage left unless we swim the main, or, forcing these, the Trojan trenches gain. This said, he strode with eager haste along, and bore amidst the thickest of the throng. Lagus, the first he met with fate to foe, had heaved a stone of mighty weight to throw. Stooping, the spear descended on his chine, just where the bone distinguished either loin. It stuck so fast, so deeply buried lay, that scarce the victor forced the steel away. His bond came on, but while he moved too slow to wished revenge, the prince prevents his blow. For warding his at once, at once he pressed, and plunged the fatal weapon in his breast. Then lewd Ancemolus he laid in dust, who stained his stepdam's bed with impious lust. And after him the Daucian twins were slain, Laris and Thimbrus on the Latian plain. So wondrous like in feature, shape, and size, as caused an error in their parents' eyes. Grateful mistake, but soon the sword decides the nice distinction, and their fate divides. For Thimbrus' head was lopped, and Laris' hand, dismembered, sought its owner on the strand. The trembling fingers yet the falchion strain, and threaten still the intended stroke in vain. Now, to renew the charge, the Arcadians came. Sight of such acts, and sense of honest shame, and grief with anger mixed their minds in flame. Then with a casual blow was Rhetus slain, who chanced as Pallas threw to cross the plain. The flying spear was after Illus sent, but Rhetus happened on a death unmeant. From Teuthras and from Tyres while he fled, the lance athwart his body laid him dead. Rolled from his chariot with a mortal wound, and intercepted fate, he spurned the ground. As when in summer welcome winds arise, the watchful shepherd to the forest flies, and fires the midmost plants, contagion spreads, and catching flames infect the neighboring heads. Around the forest flies the furious blast, and all the leafy nation sinks at last, and Vulcan rides in triumph o'er the waste. The pastor, pleased with his dire victory, beholds the satiate flames in sheets ascend the sky. So palace troops their scattered strength unite, and pouring on their foes their prince delight. Halesus came, fierce with desire of blood, but first collected in his arms he stood. Advancing then he plied the spear so well, Ladon, Demodocus, and Pheres fell. Around his head he tossed his glittering brand, and from Strimonius hewed his better hand, held up to guard his throat, then hurled a stone at Thoas' ample front and pierced the bone. It struck beneath the space of either eye, and blood and mingled brains together fly. Deep-skilled in future fates, Halesus' sire did with the youth to lonely groves retire. But when the father's mortal race was run, dire destiny laid hold upon the son, and hauled him to the war, to find beneath the Evandrian spear a memorable death. Pallas the encounter seeks, but ere he throws to Tuscan Tiber thus addressed his vows. O sacred stream, direct my flying dart, and give to pass the proud Halesus' heart. His arms and spoils thy holy oak shall bear. Pleased with the bribe, the god received his prayer. For while his shield protects a friend distressed, the dart came driving on and pierced his breast. But Lausus, no small portion of the war, permits not panic fear to reign too far, caused by the death of so renowned a knight, but by his own example cheers the fight. Fierce Abbas first he slew, Abbas the stay of Trojan hopes and hindrance of the day. The Phrygian troops escaped the Greeks in vain, 
They and their mixed allies now load the plain. To the rude shock of war both armies came. Their leaders equal and their strength the same, the rear so pressed the front they could not wield their angry weapons to dispute the field. Here Pallas urges on, and Lausus there, of equal youth and beauty both appear, but both by fate forbid to breathe their native air. Their congress in the field great Jove withstands, both doomed to fall, but fall by greater hands. Meantime, Juturna warns the Daunian chief of Lausus' danger, urging swift relief. With his driven chariot he divides the crowd, and making to his friends, thus calls aloud, Let none presume his needless aid to join. Retire and clear the field, the fight is mine. To this right hand is Pallas only due. O oh, were his father here, my just revenge to view. From the forbidden space his men retired. Pallas their awe and his stern words admired, surveyed him o'er and o'er with wondering sight, struck with his haughty mien and towering height. Then to the king, your empty vaunts forbear, success I hope, and fate I cannot fear. Alive or dead I shall deserve a name, Jove is impartial and to both the same. He said, and to the void advanced his pace, pale horror sat on each Arcadian face. Then Turnus, from his chariot, leaping light, addressed himself on foot to single fight. And, as a lion, when he spies from far a bull that seems to meditate the war, bending his neck and spurning back the sand, runs roaring downward from his hilly stand, imagine eager Turnus, not more slow, to rush from high on his unequal foe. Young Pallas, when he saw the chief advance within due distance of his flying lance, prepares to charge him first, resolved to try if fortune would his want of force supply, and thus to heaven and Hercules addressed. Alcides, once on earth Evander's guest, his son adjures you by those holy rites, that hospitable board, those genial knights, assist my great attempt to gain this prize, and let proud Turnus view with dying eyes his ravished spoils. Twas heard the vain request, Alcides mourned and stifled sighs within his breast. Then Jove, to soothe his sorrow, thus began. Short bounds of life are set to mortal man. Tis virtue's work alone to stretch the narrow span. So many sons of gods in bloody fight around the walls of Troy have lost the light. My own Sarpedon fell beneath his foe. Nor I, his mighty sire, could ward the blow. Even Turnus shortly shall resign his breath, And stands already on the verge of death. This said, the god permits the fatal fight, But from the Latian fields averts his sight. Now with full force his spear young Pallas threw, And, having thrown, his shining falchion drew. The steel just grazed along the shoulder joint, And marked it slightly with a glancing point, Fierce Turnus first to nearer distance drew, and poised his pointed spear before he threw. Then, as the winged weapon whizzed along, See now, said he, whose arm is better strung. The spear kept on the fatal course, unstayed by plates of iron, which o'er the shield were laid. Through folded brass and tough bull hides it passed, his corslet pierced and reached his heart at last. In vain the youth tugs at the broken wood, the soul comes issuing with the vital blood. He falls, his arms upon his body sound, and with his bloody teeth he bites the ground. Turnus bestrode the corpse. Arcadians here, said he, my message to your master bear. Such as the sire deserved, the son I send. It costs him dear to be the Phrygian's friend. The lifeless body tell him I bestow unasked to rest his wandering ghost below. He said, and trampled down with all the force of his left foot, and spurned the wretched course. Then snatched the shining belt with gold inlaid, the belt Eurytion's artful hands had made, where fifty fatal brides expressed to sight all in the compass of one mournful night, Deprived their bridegrooms of returning light. In an ill hour insulting Turnus tore those golden spoils, And in a worse he wore. 
O mortals, blind in fate, who never know to bear high fortune or endure the low, the time shall come when Turnus, but in vain, shall wish untouched the trophies of the slain, shall wish the fatal belt were far away, and curse the dire remembrance of the day. The sad Arcadians from the unhappy field bear back the breathless body on a shield. O grace and grief of war, at once restored with praises to thy sire, at once deplored. One day first sent thee to the fighting field, beheld whole heaps of foes in battle killed. One day beheld thee dead and borne upon thy shield. This dismal news, not from uncertain fame, but sad spectators to the hero came. His friends upon the brink of ruin stand, unless relieved by his victorious hand. He whirls his sword around, without delay, and hews through adverse foes an ample way, to find fierce Turnus of his conquest proud. Evander, Pallas, all that friendship owed to large deserts, are present to his eyes his plighted hand, and hospitable ties. Four sons of Sulmo, four whom Ufens bred, he took in fight, and living victims led, to please the ghost of Pallas, and expire in sacrifice before his funeral fire. At Magus next he threw, he stooped below the flying spear, and shunned the promised blow. Then creeping, clasped the hero's knees, and prayed, by young Eulus, by thy father's shade, O spare my life, and send me back to see my longing sire and tender progeny. A lofty house I have, and wealth untold, in silver ingots and in bars of gold, all these and sums besides which see no day the ransom of this one poor life shall pay. If I survive, will Troy the less prevail? A single soul's too light to turn the scale. The hero sternly thus replied, Thy bars and ingots and the sums beside leave for thy children's lot. Thy Turnus broke all rules of war by one relentless stroke when Pallas fell. So deems nor deems alone my father's shadow, but my living son. Thus having said of kind remorse bereft, he seized his helm and dragged him with his left, then with his right hand, while his neck he wreathed up to the hilts, his shining falchion sheathed. Apollo's priest Emonides was near, his holy fillets on his front appear. Glittering in arms he shone amidst the crowd, much of his god, more of his purple proud. Him the fierce Trojan followed through the field. The holy coward fell, and forced to yield, the prince stood o'er the priest, and at one blow sent him an offering to the shades below. His arms Serestus on his shoulders bears, designed a trophy to the god of wars. Vulcanian Caeculus renews the fight, and Umbro, born upon the mountain's height, the champion cheers his troops to encounter those, and seeks revenge himself on other foes. At Anxur's shield he drove, and at the blow both shield and arm to ground together go. Anxur had boasted much of magic charms, and thought he wore impenetrable arms, so made by muttered spells, and from the spheres had life secured in vain for length of years. Then Tarquitus the field in triumph trod, a nymph his mother, his sire a god. Exulting in bright arms, he braves the prince. With his protended lance, he makes defense. Bears back his feeble foe. Then, pressing on, arrests his better hand and drags him down. Stands o'er the prostrate wretch, and as he lay, Vain tales inventing and prepared to pray, Mows off his head. The trunk a moment stood, then sunk, And rolled along the sand in blood. The vengeful victor thus upbraids the slain. Lie there, proud man, unpitied on the plain. Lie there, inglorious and without a tomb, far from thy mother and thy native home, exposed to savage beasts and birds of prey, or thrown for food to monsters of the sea. On Lycus and Antaeus next he ran, two chiefs of Turnus who led his van. They fled for fear, with these he chased along Camers the yellow-locked, and Numa strong, 
both great in arms, and both were fair and young. Camers was son to Volscans, lately slain, in wealth surpassing all the Latian train, and in Amicla fixed his silent, easy reign. And as a Gaian, when with heaven he strove, stood opposite in arms to mighty Jove, moved all his hundred hands, provoked the war, defied the forky lightning from afar, at fifty mouths his flaming breath expires, and flash for flash returns, and fires for fires. In his right hand as many swords he wields, and takes the thunder on as many shields. With strength like his the Trojan hero stood, and soon the fields with falling corpse were strowed, when once his falchion found the taste of blood. With fury scarce to be conceived, he flew against Nepheus, whom four coursers drew. They, when they see the fiery chief advance, and pushing at their chests his pointed lance, wheeled with so swift a motion, mad with fear, they threw their master headlong from the chair. They stare, they start, nor stop their course, before they bear the bounding chariot to the shore. Now Lucagus and Liger scour the plains with two white steeds, but Liger holds the reins, and Lucagus the lofty seat maintains. Bold brethren both. The former waved in air his flaming sword, Aeneas couched his spear, unused to threats and more unused to fear. Then Liger thus, Thy confidence is vain to escape from hence as from the Trojan plain nor these the steeds which Diomede bestrode, nor this the chariot where Achilles rode, nor Venus' veil is here near Neptune's shield. Thy fatal hour is come, and this the field. Thus Liger vainly vaunts. The Trojan peer returned his answer with his flying spear. As Lucagus to lash his horses bends, prone to the wheels, and his left foot portends, prepared for fight, the fatal dart arrives, and through the borders of his buckler drives, passed through and pierced his groin, the deadly wound cast from his chariot, rolled him on the ground, whom thus the chief upbraids with scornful spite. Blame not the slowness of your steeds in flight, vain shadows did not force their swift retreat, but you yourself forsake your empty seat. He said and seized at once the loosened rein, for Liger lay already on the plain, by the same shock, then stretching out his hands, the recreant thus his wretched life demands. Now by thyself, O more than mortal man, by her and him from whom thy breath began, who formed thee thus divine, I beg thee, spare this forfeit life, and hear thy suppliant's prayer. Thus much he spoke, and more he would have said. But the stern hero turned aside his head and cut him short. I hear another man. You talked not thus before the fight began. Now take your turn, and as a brother should, attend your brothers to the Stygian flood. Then through his breast his fatal sword he sent, and the soul issued at the gaping vent. As storms the skies and torrents tear the ground, thus raged the prince and scattered deaths around. At length Ascanius and the Trojan train broke from the camp, so long besieged in vain. Meantime the king of gods and mortal man held conference with his queen, and thus began. My sister goddess and well-pleasing wife, still think you Venus' aid supports the strife, sustains her Trojans, or themselves alone with inborn valor force their fortune on? How fierce in fight! with courage undecayed, judge if such warriors want immortal aid. To whom the goddess with the charming eyes, soft in her tone, submissively replies, Why, O oh my sovereign lord, whose frown I fear, and cannot unconcerned your anger bear, why urge you thus my grief, when, if I still, as once I was, were mistress of your will, from your almighty power your pleasing wife might gain the grace of lengthening Turnus' life, securely snatch him from the fatal fight, and give him to his aged father's sight. Now let him perish, since you hold it good, and glut the Trojans with his pious blood. Yet from our lineage he derives his name, and in the fourth degree from God Pelimnus came. 
yet he devoutly pays you rites divine and offers daily incense at your shrine then shortly thus the sovereign god replied since in my power and goodness you confide if for a little space a lengthened span you beg reprieve for this expiring man i grant you leave to take your turnus hence from instant fate and can so far dispense but if some secret meaning lies beneath to save the short-lived youth from destined death or if a farther thought you entertain to change the fates you feed your hopes in vain to whom the goddess thus with weeping eyes and what if that request your tongue denies your heart should grant and not a short reprieve but length of certain life to turnus give now speedy death attends the guiltless youth if my presaging soul divines with truth which oh i wish might err through causeless fears and you for you have power prolong his years thus having said involved in clouds she flies and drives a storm before her through the skies swift she descends alighting on the plain where the fierce foes a dubious fight maintain of air condensed a spectre soon she made and what aeneas was such seemed the shade adorned with dardan arms the phantom bore his head aloft a plumy crest he wore this hand appeared a shining sword to wield and that sustained an imitated shield with manly mien he stalked along the ground nor wanted voice belied nor vaunting sound thus haunting ghosts appear to waking sight or dreadful visions in our dreams by night the spectre seems the downian chief to dare and flourishes his empty sword in air at this advancing turnus hurled his spear the phantom wheeled and seemed to fly for fear deluded turnus thought the trojan fled and with vain hopes his haughty fancy fed whether o coward thus he calls aloud nor found he spoke to wind and chased a cloud why thus forsake your bride receive from me the fated land you sought so long by sea he said and brandishing at once his blade with eager pace pursued the flying shade by chance a ship was fastened to the shore which from old clusium king osinius bore the plank was ready laid for safe ascent for shelter there the trembling shadow bent and skipped and skulked and under hatches went exulting turnus with regardless haste ascends the plank and to the galley passed scarce had he reached the prow saturnia's hand the halsers cuts and shoots the ship from land with wind in poop the vessel ploughs the sea and measures back with speed her former way meantime aeneas seeks his absent foe and sends his slaughtered troops to shades below the guileful phantom now forsook the shroud and flew sublime and vanished in a cloud too late young turnus the delusion found far on the sea still making from the ground then thankless for a life redeemed by shame with sense of honour stung and forfeit fame fearful besides of what in fight had passed his hands and haggard eyes to heaven he cast o jove he cried for what offence have deserved to bear this endless infamy whence am i forced and whither am i born how and with what reproach shall i return shall ever i behold the latian plain or see laurentum's lofty towers again what will they say of their deserting chief the war was mine i fly from their relief i led to slaughter and in slaughter leave and even from hence their dying groans receive here overmatched in fight in heaps they lie there scattered o'er the fields ignobly fly gape wide o earth and draw me down alive or o ye pitying winds a wretch relieve on sands or shelves the splitting vessel drive or set me shipwrecked on some desert shore where no rutulian eyes may see me more unknown to friends or foes or conscious fame lest she should follow and my flight proclaim thus turnus raved and various fates revolved the choice was doubtful but the death resolved and now the sword and now the sea took place 
that to revenge, and this to purge disgrace. Sometimes he thought to swim the stormy main, by stretch of arms the distant shore to gain. Thrice he the sword assayed, and thrice the flood, but Juno, moved with pity, both withstood, and thrice repressed his rage. Strong gales supplied, and pushed the vessel o'er the swelling tide. At length she lands him on his native shores, and to his father's longing arms restores. Meantime, by Jove's impulse, Mezentius armed, succeeding Turnus, with his ardor warmed his fainting friends, reproached their shameful flight, repelled the victors, and renewed the fight. Against their king the Tuscan troops conspire, such is their hate, and such their fierce desire of wished revenge, on him and him alone. All hands employed, and all their darts are thrown. He, like a solid rock by seas enclosed, to raging winds and roaring waves opposed. From his proud summit looking down, disdains their empty menace, and unmoved remains. Beneath his feet fell haughty Hebrus dead, then Latagus and Palmus as he fled. At Latagus a weighty stone he flung, his face was flatted, and his helmet wrung. But Palmus from behind receives his wound. Hamstringed he falls, and grovels on the ground. His crest and armor from his body torn, Thy shoulders Lausus, and thy head adorn. Evas and Mimas, both of Troy, he slew. Mimas, his birth from fair Theano, drew. Born on that fatal night, when big with fire the queen produced young Paris to his sire. But Paris in the Phrygian fields was slain, unthinking Mimas on the Latian plain. And as a savage boar on mountains bred, with forest mast and fattening marshes fed, when once he sees himself in toils enclosed by huntsmen and their eager hounds opposed, he wets his tusks and turns and dares the war. The invaders dart their javelins from afar, all keep aloof and safely shout around. But none presumes to give a nearer wound. He frets and froths, erects his bristled hide, and shakes a grove of lances from his side. Not otherwise the troops with hate inspired, and just revenge against the tyrant fired. Their darts with clamor at a distance strive, and only keep the languished war alive. From Coritus came Acron to the fight, who left his spouse betrothed and unconsummate knight. Mezentius sees him through the squadron's ride, proud of the purple favors of his bride. Then, as a hungry lion who beholds a gamesome goat who frisks about the folds, or beamy stag that grazes on the plain, he runs, he roars, he shakes his rising mane, he grins and opens wide his greedy jaws, the prey lies panting underneath his paws, he fills his famished maw, his mouth runs o'er with unchewed morsels while he churns the gore. So proud Mazentius rushes on his foes, and first unhappy Akron overthrows. Stretched at his length he spurns the swarthy ground, the lance, besmeared with blood, lies broken in the wound. Then with disdain the haughty victor viewed Orodes flying, nor the wretch pursued, nor thought the dastard's back deserved a wound. But running gained the advantage of the ground. Then turning short he met him face to face, to give his victor the better grace. Orodes falls in equal fight oppressed. Mezentius fixed his foot upon his breast, and rested lance, and thus aloud he cries, Lo, here the champion of my rebels lies. The fields around with Io Paeon ring, and peals of shouts applaud the conquering king. At this the vanquished with his dying breath thus faintly spoke and prophesied in death. Nor thou, proud man, unpunished shalt remain. Like death attends thee on this fatal plain. Then, sourly smiling, thus the king replied, For what belongs to me let Jove provide, But die thou first, whatever chance ensue. He said, and from the wound the weapon drew. A hovering mist came swimming o'er his sight, And sealed his eyes in everlasting night. 
By Caedicus Alcathus was slain, Sacrator laid Hidaspes on the plain. Orses the strong to greater strength must yield, He with Parthenius were by Rapo killed. Then brave Messapus Erechites slew, Who from Lycaon's blood his lineage drew. But from his headstrong horse his fate he found, Who threw his master as he made a bound, the chief alighting stuck him to the ground. Then Clonius hand to hand on foot assails, The Trojan sinks, and Neptune's son prevails. Aegis the Lycian, stepping forth with pride, To single fight the boldest foe defied, Whom Tuscan Valerus by force o'ercame, And not belied his mighty father's fame. Salius to death the great Antronius sent, But the same fate the victor underwent, Slain by Nelke's hand, well skilled to throw the flying dart, And draw the far-deceiving bow. Thus equal deaths are dealt with equal chance, By turns they quit their ground, by turns advance, Victors and vanquished in the various field, Nor wholly overcome, nor wholly yield. The gods from heaven survey the fatal strife, And mourn the miseries of human life. Above the rest two goddesses appear, concerned for each, here venus juno there amidst the crowd infernal ate shakes her scourge aloft and crest of hissing snakes once more the proud mazentius with disdain brandished his spear and rushed into the plain where towering in the midmost rank she stood like tall orion stalking o'er the flood when with his brawny breast he cuts the waves his shoulders scarce the topmost billow laves or like a mountain ash whose roots are spread deep fixed in earth in clouds he hides his head the trojan prince beheld him from afar and dauntless undertook the doubtful war collected in his strength and like a rock poised on his base mazentius stood the shock he stood and measuring first with careful eyes the space his spear could reach aloud he cries my strong right hand and sword assist my stroke those only gods mazentius will invoke his armor from the trojan pirate torn by my triumphant lausus shall be worn he said and with his utmost force he threw the massy spear which hissing as it flew reached the celestial shield that stopped the course but glancing thence the yet unbroken force took a new bent obliquely and betwixt the side and bowels famed anthores fixed anthores had from argos travelled far alcides friend and brother of the war till tired with toils fair italy he chose and in evander's palace sought repose now falling by another's wound his eyes he cast to heaven on Argos thinks and dies. The pious Trojan then his javelin sent, The shield gave way, through treble plates it went, Of solid brass, of linen trebly rolled, And three bull hides which round the buckler fold. All these it passed resistless in the course, Transpierced his thigh, and spent its dying force. The gaping wound gushed out a crimson flood, the Trojan, glad with sight of hostile blood, his falchion drew to closer fight addressed, and with new force his fainting foe oppressed. His father's peril Lausus viewed with grief. He sighed, he wept, he ran to his relief. And here, heroic youth, tis here I must to thy immortal memory be just, and sing an act so noble and so new, posterity will scarce believe tis true. Pained with his wound, and useless for the fight, The father sought to save himself by flight. Encumbered, slow he dragged the spear along, Which pierced his thigh, and in his buckler hung. The pious youth, resolved on death, Below the lifted sword, springs forth to face the foe, Protects his parent, and prevents the blow. Shouts of applause ran ringing through the field, To see the son the vanquished father shield. All, fired with generous indignation, strive, And with a storm of darts to distance drive the Trojan chief, Who held at bay from far, on his Vulcanian orb sustained the war. As when thick hail comes rattling in the wind, The ploughman, passenger, and labouring hind, For shelter to the neighbouring covert fly, Or housed, or safe in hollow caverns lie, 
but that o'erblown when heaven above em smiles return to travel and renew their toils aeneas thus o'erwhelmed on every side the storm of darts undaunted did abide and thus to lausus loud with friendly threatening cried why wilt thou rush to certain death and rage in rash attempts beyond thy tender age betrayed by pious love nor thus forborne the youth desists but with insulting scorn provokes the lingering prince whose patience tired gave place and all his breast with fury fired for now the fates prepared their sharpened shears and lifted high the flaming sword appears which full descending with a frightful sway through shield and corslet forced the impetuous way and buried deep in his fair bosom lay the purple streams through the thin armor strove and drenched the embroidered coat his mother wove and life at length forsook his heaving heart loath from so sweet a mansion to depart but when with blood and paleness all o'erspread the pious youth beheld young lausus dead he grieved he wept the sight an image brought of his own filial love a sadly pleasing thought then stretched his hand to hold him up and said poor hapless youth what praises can be paid to love so great to such transcendent store of early worth and sure presage of more except whate'er aeneas can afford untouched thy arms untaken be thy sword and all that pleased thee living still remain inviolate and sacred to the slain thy body on thy parents i bestow to rest thy soul at least if shadows know or have a sense of human things below there to thy fellow ghosts with glory tell twas by the great aeneas hand i fell with this his distant friends he beckons near provokes their duty and prevents their fear himself assists to lift him from the ground with clotted locks and blood that welled from out the wound meantime his father now no father stood and washed his wounds by tiber's yellow flood oppressed with anguish panting and o'erspent his fainting limbs against an oak he leant a bow his brazen helmet did sustain his heavier arms lay scattered on the plain a chosen train of youth around him stand his drooping head was rested on his hand his grisly beard his pensive bosom sought and all on lausus ran his restless thought careful concerned his danger to prevent he much inquired and many a message sent to warn him from the field alas in vain behold his mournful followers bear him slain o'er his broad shield still gushed the yawning wound and drew a bloody trail along the ground far off he heard their cries far off divined the dire event with a foreboding mind with dust he sprinkled first his hoary head then both his lifted hands to heaven he spread last the dear corpse embracing thus he said what joys alas could this frail being give that i have been so covetous to live to see my son and such a son resign his life a ransom for preserving mine and am i then preserved and art thou lost how much too dear has that redemption cost tis now my bitter banishment i feel this is a wound too deep for time to heal my guilt thy growing virtues did defame my blackness blotted thy unblemished name chased from a throne abandoned and exiled for foul misdeeds were punishments too mild i owed my people these and from their hate with less resentment could have borne my fate and yet i live and yet sustain the sight of hated men and of more hated light but will not long with that he raised from ground his fainting limbs that staggered with his wound yet with a mind resolved and unappalled with pains or perils for his courser called well mouthed well managed who himself did dress with daily care and mounted with success his aid in arms his ornament in peace soothing his courage with a gentle stroke the steed seemed sensible while thus he spoke o rebus we have lived too long for me if life and long were terms that could agree this day thou either shalt bring back the head and bloody trophies of the trojan dead this day thou either shalt revenge my woe for murdered lausus on his cruel foe 
or if inexorable fate deny our conquest with thy conquered master die for after such a lord i rest secure thou wilt no foreign reins or trojan load endure he said and straight the officious courser kneels to take his wonted weight his hands he fills with pointed javelins on his head he laced his glittering helm which terribly was graced with waving horsehair nodding from afar then spurred his thundering steed amidst the war love anguish wrath and grief to madness wrought despair and secret shame and conscious thought of inborn worth his laboring soul oppressed rolled in his eyes and raged within his breast then loud he called aeneas thrice by name the loud repeated voice to glad aeneas came great jove he said and the far-shooting god inspire thy mind to make thy challenge good he spoke no more but hastened void of fear and threatened with his long protended spear to whom mezentius thus thy vaunts are vain my lausus lies extended on the plain he's lost thy conquest is already won the wretched sire is murdered in the sun nor fate i fear but all the gods defy forbear thy threats my business is to die but first receive this parting legacy he said and straight a whirling dart he sent another after and another went round in a spacious ring he rides the field and vainly plies the impenetrable shield thrice rode he round and thrice aeneas wheeled turned as he turned the golden orb withstood the strokes and bore about an iron wood impatient of delay and weary groan still to defend and to defend alone to wrench the darts which in his buckler light urged and o'er laboured in unequal fight at length resolved he throws with all his force full at the temples of the warrior horse just where the stroke was aimed the unerring spear made way and stood transfixed through either ear seized with unwonted pain surprised with fright the wounded steed curvets and raised upright lights on his feet before his hoofs behind spring up in air aloft and lash the wind down comes the rider headlong from his height his horse came after with unwieldy weight and floundering forward pitching on his head his lord's encumbered shoulder overlaid from either host the mingled shouts and cries of trojans and rutulians rend the skies aeneas hastening waved his fatal sword high o'er his head with this reproachful word now where are now thy vaunts the fierce disdain of proud mazentius and the lofty strain struggling and wildly staring on the skies with scarce recovered sight he thus replies why these insulting words this waste of breath to souls undaunted and secure of death tis no dishonour for the brave to die nor came i here with hope victory nor ask i life nor fought with that design as i had used my fortune use thou thine my dying son contracted no such band the gift is hateful from his murderer's hand for this this only favour let me sue if pity can to conquered foes be due refuse it not but let my body have the last retreat of humankind a grave too well i know the insulting people's hate protect me from their vengeance after fate this refuge for my poor remains provide and lay my much-loved lausus by my side he said and to the sword his throat applied the crimson stream disdained his arms around and the disdainful soul came rushing through the wound